Hello, everyone, and welcome to Zoom's second quarter fiscal year 2022 earnings release. I'd like to remind everyone that this call is being recorded. At this time, I'd like to hand it over to Tom McCallum, Head of Investor Relations. Thank you, Matt. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Zoom's earnings video webinar for the second quarter of fiscal 2022. Joining me today will be Zoom's founder and CEO, Eric Yuan, and Zoom's CFO, Kelly Steckelberg. Our earnings press release was issued today after the market closed and may be downloaded from the Investor Relations page at investors.zoom.com. Also on this page, you'll be able to find a copy of today's prepared remarks and a slide deck with financial highlights that along with our earnings release, include a reconciliation of GAAP to non-GAAP financial results. During this call, we will make four looking statements, including statements regarding our financial outlook for the third quarter and full fiscal year 2022. Zoom's ex expectations regarding financial and business trends, Zoom's growth strategy and business aspirations to drive evolution on multiple fronts as organizations and people reimagine work, communication, and collaboration, and Zoom being well positioned to be successful as a platform. These statements are only predictions that are based on what we believe today, and actual results may differ materially. These four looking statements are subject to the risks and other factors that could affect our performance and financial results, which we discuss in detail in our filings with the SEC, including our annual report on Form 10K and quarterly reports on Form 10Q. Zoom assumes no obligation to update any four looking statements we may make on today's webinar. In addition, as you all know, we announced our intent to acquire 5.9 in July. Clearly, we're excited about joining forces with 5.9, but please note that we will not be discussing or addressing questions regarding the pending transaction this time as we are in the process of regulatory review. And with that, let me turn the discussion over to Eric. Thank you, Tom. And thank you all. And welcome to everyone joining us on today's webinar. I wanted to start by thanking our customers and partners for their trust and loyalty, which led to our continued strong revenue growth alongside remarkable profitability and a free cash flow. We also want to thank our hardworking employees for their dedication to delivering happiness to our customers and partners. I have been humbled by the stories of how finance professionals have leveraged Zoom to reimagine the way they work. Specifically, I'd like to thank Charlie Munger of Berkshire Hathaway for his remarks about how Zoom has added so much convenience to his life. We are so delighted to count Charlie as a happy user. And I nominated myself to be Charlie's personal Zoom tech support if he ever needs it. In Q2, we also achieved several milestones setting the foundation for us to thrive as a platform. In July, we launched the Zoom apps, which brings over 50 apps right into the Zoom meeting experience. And this is just the beginning. The beauty of our platform is it allows our ecosystem of developers to add even more functionality by building apps where workflows are integrated with meeting interactions. This is a win-win because better integrations will boost our customers' productivity and afford our developers' exposure to our large user base. The Zoom Apps Fund, which has already invested in over a dozen startups in our Zoom Apps and SDK ecosystem, further aligns us with the developers, enabling them to focus more on innovation. We are also excited to have launched Zoom events in July. Zoom events is an easy yet powerful solution to produce and host the company and the public events. It acts as a layer above our existing Zoom video webinars and Zoom meetings products. Zoomtopia will be with you on Zoom events in only two weeks, and we hope to see all of you there. In Q2, we saw several large customers' upsells. We were very happy to expand with a leading tech firm who increased their meetings licenses over six-fold to 95,000. 
and with a global finance financial services customer who added over 63,000 Zoom phone licenses, making them our new largest customer. Both wins were displacement of legacy solutions that Zoom beat in terms of reliability, simplicity, and integration. And let me recognize a few very big wins for the quarter. I want to welcome NEC Corporation to the Zoom family. Based out of Japan, NEC is a leader in the integration of IT and network technologies behind their slogan, orchestrating a brighter world. In order to enhance the productivity, collaboration, and happiness of their global workforce, NEC deployed approximately 110,000 Zoom meetings licenses. I also want to welcome Seagit technology to the Zoom family. Seagit is a global mass data story infrastructure leader, innovating world-class precision engineer data storage and management solutions with a focus on sustainable partnerships. Seagit recently decided to modernize and integrate their global communications infrastructure with over 14,000 Zoom meetings licenses and over 17,000 Zoom phone licenses. Next is a Zoom phone upsell. In Q2 of last year, we welcomed ExxonMobil, which develops and applies next generation technologies to help safely and responsibly meet the world during need for energy and chemical products to the Zoom family. They began as a Zoom video conferencing customer to enable their teams to collaborate globally. We are very grateful to have seen our partnership evolve over the past year and excited that ExxonMobil has recently decided to add Zoom phone to further enhance the user experience for their global workforce, leveraging a communications platform that is very easy to deploy and manage. In addition to these great customer wins, we also closed another strategic channel partnership with Telcomcell, the largest cellular operator in Indonesia, which is the world's fourth largest country by population. Telcomcell understands and wants to support their 170 million subscribers' need for seamless and reliable virtual meetings to thrive in the digital workplace era. They will be leveraging the power of Zoom's developer platform and ISV partnership program to deliver a fully integrated solution where their CloudX offerings for the enterprise segment and Zoom native apps for the consumer segment. The collaboration between Telcomcell and Zoom will bring in communication to the next level by combining Zoom's strong capabilities and feature-rich platform with the telecom sales best quality network and the localized interface. Together, creating a powerful tool to improve customer productivity and collaboration. Thank you, ANC, Seagate, ExxonMobil, and telecom cell. I love you all. Enterprises want digital platforms that combine meetings, phone, events, office technology, and developer solutions in a way that is simple, reliable, and frictionless. This fundamental truth underpins our leadership position in video conferencing and will help to drive further growth in Zoom phone and Zoom rooms as we expand our platform and addressable market in the hybrid world. Today, we're very fortunate to be a leading global brand with over half a million customers having more than 10 employees. Our internal innovation engine is very strong and boosted by our growing Zoom apps developer ecosystem and acquisitions such as CATS that will strengthen our position in AI transcription and uh, translation. As organizations and people reimagine work, communications and collaboration, we are faced with a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to drive this evolution 
in multiple, on multiple fronts. Thanks again to the hard work of our over 5,700 employees and the trust of our loyal customers. We are positioned very well to be successful as a platform embracing and enabling hybrid work. I'm very excited about the future. The journey has only begun. And with that, let me pass it over to Kelly. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. And hello, everyone. We had an eventful Q2 with several highlights. The first of which was the strength in the enterprise. We were able to grow the number of enterprise customers spending more than $1 million in ARR by 77% year over year. And the second highlight is the acceleration we have seen with Zoom Phone. We grew the number of customers spending more than $100,000 in ARR on Zoom Phone by 241% year over year. In August, We will reach and actually after right before this call, we reached two million Zoom phone seats only eight months after reaching our first million. We added eight Zoom phone customers with more than ten thousand seats in the first half of FY. Y22, bringing us to a total of 26. And in Q2, we broke our record for the largest Zoom phone deal to date, twice in the same day. It is important to note that as we've just lapped our first full quarter year over year compare since the start of the pandemic, we have seen customers return to more thoughtful, measured buying patterns. While revenue, profitability, and cash flow were strong in the second quarter and the first half, other metrics have begun to normalize, especially when compared to the unprecedented year over year comps. In Q2, total revenue grew 50. 54% year, year over year to $1.02 billion, marking our first billion dollar plus quarter, only five quarters after reaching a billion dollar annual run rate. The top line result exceeded the high end of our guidance of $990 million. We saw strength in our direct and channel businesses, which grew at twice the rate of our online business. Zoom phone, Zoom rooms, and Asia Pack growth also accelerated in the quarter. The year over year growth in revenue for the quarter was driven by a healthy mix between new and existing customers, where customers account, where, sorry, excuse me, new customers accounted for approximately 74% of the incremental revenue, and existing customers accounted for 26% of the incremental revenue. Let's take a look at the key customer metrics for the quarter. We saw 131% year over year growth in the up market as we ended the quarter with 2,278 customers generating more than $100,000 in trailing 12 months revenue. We exited the quarter with approximately 504,900 customers with more than 10 employees, up 36% year over year and representing 64% of revenue. In Q2, customers with 10 or fewer employees represented approximately 36% of revenue, in line with Q2 of last year, but down from its high of 38% in Q3 of last year. As we discussed previously, this cohort, which comprises SMB and consumers, 
who typically purchase online, is more volatile, and we expect it to continue to decline as a percentage of revenue as customers adjust to the evolving environment. Our net dollar expansion rate for customers with more than 10 employees exceeded 130% for the 13th consecutive quarter as existing customers increased their spend with Zoom and upsells of Zoom phone and Zoom rooms picked up pace. Both domestic and international markets had strong growth during the quarter. Our America's revenue grew 50% year over year. Our combined APAC and EMEA revenue grew 62% year over year to be approximately 33% of revenue, up from 31% a year ago. In recent quarters, we have made significant investments in our international teams. In Asia Pacific, our direct sales team drove several strong wins in the enterprise segment. However, in EMEA, we saw some headwinds, which were predominantly driven by declines in the online segment. Now, turning to profitability, which was strong from both GAAP and non-GAAP perspectives. I will focus on our non-GAAP results, which exclude stock-based compensation expense and associated payroll taxes, charitable donation of common stock, acquisition-related expenses, net litigation expenses, and gains or losses on strategic investments. Non-GAAP gross margin in Q2 was 76.2%, compared to 72.3% in Q2 of last year and 73.9% in Q1 of this year. The sequential improvement in gross margin is mainly due to new data center capacity coming online and lower usage during the summer months, particularly with schools. We now expect gross margin outlook to be higher than previously discussed at approximately 75% for the remainder of the fiscal year, even while we continue to support free K-12 education. Research and development expense grew by 89% year over year to approximately $54 million. As a percentage of total revenue, R&D expense was approximately 5.3%, an increase from Q2 of last year, demonstrating our ongoing commitment to building out our engineering teams globally and maintaining best-in-class product and innovation. Sales and marketing expense grew by 72% year-over-year to $211 million. Sales and marketing expense was approximately 20.7% of total revenue, an increase from Q2 of last year, mainly due to investments and hiring to drive sustainable future growth. We plan to increase investment in global sales capacity, as well as digital marketing and events to drive additional leads for our sales teams across meetings, phone, rooms, and events. GNA expense in the quarter grew by 73% to $89 million as we continue to scale these functions and invest in systems, automation, and compliance to meet our new scale. GNA expense was approximately 8.7% of total revenue, a slight increase from Q2 of last year. The revenue upside in the quarter carried through to the bottom line with non-GAAP operating income of $425 million exceeding our guidance. This translates to a 41.6% non-GAAP operating margin for Q2, steady with both Q2 last year and Q1 of this year. Non-GAAP diluted earnings per share in Q2 was $1.36 on approximately 306 million non-GAAP weighted average shares outstanding. This result is 21 cents above the high end of our guidance and 44 cents above Q2 of last year. Turning to the balance sheet, deferred revenue at the end of the period was $1.2 billion, up 59% year over year from $743 million. Looking at both our build and unbuilt contracts, our RPO totaled approximately $2.3 billion, up 66% year over year from $1.4 billion. We expect to recognize approximately 69% of the total RPO as revenue over the next 12 months, as compared to 72% in Q2 of last year, reflecting a shift back to longer term plans. It is important to remember that because over 40% of our business is billed monthly and typically bought online, deferred revenue and RPO trends are not reliable predictors of future revenue growth. 
As I mentioned last quarter, the timing of our renewals has increasingly shifted to the beginning of the fiscal year, with Q1 now representing our largest renewal quarter. This shift in seasonality is a result of a significant growth we experienced in the first half of FY21. We expect this front-weighted seasonality will persist and potentially become even more pronounced given the scale of our base and practice of upselling coterminously with existing contracts. As such, we would expect total deferred revenue and RPO to be modestly down from Q2 to Q3. We ended the quarter with approximately $5.1 billion in cash, cash equivalents, and marketable securities, excluding restricted cash. We had strong operating cash flow in the quarter of $468 million, up from $401 million in Q2 of last year. Free cash flow was $455 million, up from $373 million in Q2 of last year. The increase is primarily attributable to the top line growth and discipline spending. Looking at the remainder of the fiscal year, we expect to increase our capital expenditures related to ongoing data center expansion to support our growth outlook. Now, turning to guidance. Please note that the ever-changing nature of the global pandemic continues to impact our segments and regions in different ways. Our outlook is based on our current assessment of the business environment. Specifically, our outlook assumes that our direct and channel business will continue to experience robust growth, while our online business will be a headwind in the coming quarters as smaller customers and consumers adjust to the evolving environment. For the third quarter of FY22, we expect revenue to be in the range of $1.015 to $1.02 billion. We expect non-GAAP operating income to be in the range of 340 to $345 million. Our outlook for non-GAAP earnings per share is $1.07 to $1.08 based on approximately 309 million shares outstanding. For the full year of FY22, we expect revenue to be in the range of $4.005 to $4.015 billion which would represent approximately 51% year-over-year growth. We expect non-GAAP operating income to be in the range of approximately 1.5 to $1.51 billion, which would represent approximately 53 to 54% year-over-year growth. Our outlook for the non-GAAP earnings per share is $4.75 to $4.79, based on approximately 308 million shares outstanding. Before concluding, I'd like to welcome everyone to join us in two weeks at Zoomtopia, our two-day immersive experience that is packed with exciting product updates, guest speakers, and virtual networking opportunities. And on day one of Zoomtopia, please join us for our financial analyst briefing, where we will be providing you with greater detail on Zoom phone, the platform, our channel partnerships, and much more. And as always, Zoom is grateful to be a driving force enabling connection and collaboration worldwide with our high quality, frictionless and secure communications platform. Thank you to the entire Zoom team, our customers, our community and our investors. If you have not yet enabled your video, please do so now for the interactive portion of this meeting. Matt, please queue up our first question. Our first question is from Itai Kidron with Oppenheimer. Hey guys, thanks. Uh, Matt, don't forget to unmute yourself. Uh, great quarter again, uh, guys. Uh, Kelly, I wanna focus kind of on this transition. Clearly you're doing extremely well with phones. It's phenomenal, the growth that you're seeing over there. Uh, but can you give me a little bit more insights as to what is the gro growth in meetings right here, right now? My math suggests a very significant deceleration in your uh, expansion rate. And um, I would suspect that that's tied specifically to meetings decelerating. Help me think about the contribution of growth of those two elements and, you know, perhaps how would that change over the next 12 months? So I think in terms of the... Um, the expansion rate, you're talking about the implied expansion rate that you calculated. 
Yes. Yeah. And I just want to remind you, first of all, that when you calculate that, it includes all of our customer base. And as we mentioned, we are seeing headwinds in the online segment of our business for sure. So that's that I would say that um, while we don't break out revenue, you know, we see strength, continued strength in the up market enterprise in both meetings and phone. And where you're seeing that um, challenge in the implied metric, it's really coming from the online segment of our business. So should I interpret that? that to, to me that churn is now finally rising in that category. Is that the right way to think about this going forward? Now, now that the economy is slowly opening, some businesses, I guess, scaling back on, on the usage here? Yeah, so remember the online business is primarily, not, not exclusively, but primarily small businesses and individuals. And I think what we've seen is, um, well, you know, while the future of Delta is still unknown, we do see individuals, especially moving around the world and feeling comfortable. Like I think we were talking about most of us are probably um, socializing in person now, doing fewer things like Zoom happy hours. And that's where we're starting to see some of the challenges. So the net dollar expansion in the online segment is, is what's driving, pulling that number down a little bit. Got it. Very good. Thanks. Yep. Our next question is from Steve Enders with KeyBank. Okay, great. Thanks for, uh, thanks for taking my question here. Um, I guess I just want to dig in a little bit more on kind of the trends you're seeing in the second half. Uh, it looks like you're now uh, guiding down a little bit, at least a downtrend, or I think before we're, we're talking about an uptrend. So just want to get a better sense for what's the biggest incremental change that you're seeing there in the outlook and what's changed in the past you know, three months specifically. Yeah, so again, we continue to see strength in our up market. We're excited about what we're seeing in the enterprise and in phone international, in, and international. We all saw growth accelerate in Q2. When we look out, though, what we have seen is um, a slowdown in the online segment of the business, which, again, even though the pandemic seems to be far from over, we are happy that people are feeling more comfortable being out traveling. And that's really where we're seeing the slowdown. And, you know, we had, if you back all the way up to when we gave guidance at the beginning of the year, we had expected that towards the end of the year, but it's just happened a little bit more quickly than, than we expected. And I mean, of course, we feel good that people are out moving around the world. Um, but it's certainly creating some some headwinds, as we said, in the online segment of our business. Okay, great. And is that creating any opportunities then for, as you know, as companies do you think about going back to the office for, for Zoom rooms and incremental activity uh, activity with that product? Absolutely. So we saw Zoom rooms start to accelerate again in Q2, which was very exciting as our customers are planning and thinking about the um, it attach rates more than doubled quarter over quarter from Q1 to Q2. So absolute companies are preparing and planning for welcoming their employees back to the office. Okay, perfect. Thanks for taking my questions. Yeah, thank you, Steve. Our next question is from Taz Kujalji with Guggenheim. Hey, Taz, you're on mute. Can you guys hear me now? Yes, Just, hi, Taz. Sorry about that. Hi, I have a question on Zoom phone. So if you look at uh, the numbers reported tonight, you added about 500 million seats, I think, in the last four months. Prior to that, you were adding about 500 million seat, 500K seats every quarter. It looks like a bit of a slowdown in the number of seats you're adding this quarter. Is, is that a fair comment? You know, it's almost exactly the same time frame because I think we had announced in December that we hit a million, and then we announced 1.5 on our call in April, and then you know, one, two million on this call. So it's almost exactly at the same pace. Got it. And then just one follow up. You said uh, weakness in the uh, in the online segment. Is that coming from just increased churn or are you seeing a slowdown in the in new customer acquisition in that in that line item? It's it's a little bit of both. So um, as we mentioned, we specifically saw some challenges in certain regions like EMEA where the world you know, at least for a period of time was a little more open again and people were moving around. And that's where we see, you know, people taking advantage of being out in the world and seeing some, you know, slower top line bookings as well as accelerated churn. Thank you. Our next question is from Mita Marshall with Morgan Stanley. 
Great. Thanks. Um, Kelly, just wanted to dig into your kind of commentary on more measured spending patterns that you're seeing and, you know, taking away from kind of the the smaller business commentary that you've been giving and focusing that on enterprise. And so just trying to get a sense, you know, does that mean, you know, normalizing the amount of seats that they're adding or, you know, that they're rationalizing kind of the seats that they've had, that they're rationalizing number of video solutions that they're having in-house, just what does that kind of commentary around more measured patterns around the enterprise business mean? Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Mita. We, we saw this start a little bit in Q1 and now continue into Q2, where I think it's not necessarily measured in terms of how much they're buying, but more measured and thoughtful in how they are buying, in that they want to take their time. They're doing more complete, like proof of concepts, for example, versus if you think about a year ago, they were in this sort of stage of trying to keep the lights on almost and, and buying very quickly. And now they're taking the time to really be thoughtful. And it's just, it's a, it's a, it's back to kind of the way they used to buy pre pandemic, which is just a much more normal buying pattern. So I think that we're back to more normal and, you know, the sort of four quarters ish we saw last year was really the, the blip. And now we're back to a more normal measured approach that customers are taking. And as part of that, just because it's a couple of decision with phone now, or just, anything having to do with that? I, I think that um, certainly the phone is a different buying cycle, but usually by the time they get to phone, they already know Zoom. So it's it's not that that is necessarily slowing it down. It's just that they're taking their time to think about these, these decisions that they're making. Okay, great, thanks. Our next question is from Matthew Van Bleet with BTIG. BTIG. Yeah, hi, thanks for taking the question. I guess on the, the continued success on, on Zoom phone here, um, you know, called out a number of very large deals. Curious on, and you know, how often you're being brought in where they're also contemplating a contact center um, upgrade, you know, where, where have you stood? Obviously the partnership with Five Nine has been in place for a while, but just more generally speaking, how often um, is upgrading to Zoom phone a part of a broader uh, modernization across um, that could potentially include contact center? Um, hi, Matt. I actually don't know exactly off the, the top of my head the specifics around that. Um, you know, we obviously um, having an integrated phone and contact center solution is, is really important to many companies, which is why, you know, we're excited about the, the deal that we're working on with Five9. And um, as you say, we've been partnering with them. We also, you know, have other partnerships in place as well. And so um, there's, there's nothing different about that that has changed. I, I'd have to go back and look. I don't know exactly what the typical catch rates are between those two, though. Eric, if you have... If you have a perspective on that, feel free. Yeah, sure. So, Matt, if you look at it, our installer base, right? For now, I think, uh, you know, we really wanted to migrate from uh, on-prem, you know, uh, PBX system, you know, to the cloud, right? That's where the, the huge you know, opportunities uh, comes from. Also, you know, since the pandemic, I think we do see some of the enterprise customers, they also started asking about, hey, what's your... Uh, cloud, you know, contact center strategy because they started, you know, planning now, right? That's why we think that this is kind of for the new opportunity for us, not only for the brand new revenue stream for contact center, but also it might have, you know, uh, further, you know, grow our phone business as well. Because, you know, like one year ago, right? You know, you know, where, you know, a few large enterprise customers, they really wanted to migrate their on plan, you know, you know contact center solution. Now, given the you know, digital, you know, uh, uh, transformation for almost every enterprise customers, we do see more and more customers that are very interested. That's why it's timing wise, it's perfect for us to double down on the cloud based contact center approach. Great. And then following up quickly on the education front, you know, as schools get back into session, um, you know, whether or not they're going to be in person or, or, or not is sort of up, up to debate here. But um, I guess what's the, what's the, I guess, potential of monetizing more of that uh, install base? Is it still going to be a relatively free solution or how has that uh, strategy evolved? Thanks. So Matt, you know, before I answer to that question, you know, as you know, our company's value is care. The number one thing is really about the community, right? For to support the K-12 schools, this I would say that's no burden for us to support that at no cost, right? We feel very proud. 
we never thought about how to monetize uh, you know our service for those k-12 schools right now they all go back to school right with that we have more benefits you know resources right to think about how to monetize other you know uh, uh, installer base like give them some like a free users and, you know last year we were, we were extremely busy to help the world to have the people stay connected we even did not have a bandwidth to think about how to monetize monetize those free users right i mean the, how to embrace the consumer right we never thought about that before now it's right time right how to think about in embrace the consumer strategy how to monetize those free users is something very you know we are very excited we do not want to monetize those k-12 schools you know it's our responsibility to help them as always thank you thank you mac our next question is from pat walravens with jmp securities great thank you hi you guys i mean i don't think there's ever been a company that has grown so fast and you know realistically pulled a lot of demand forward right because everyone needed to get their their video conferencing solutions uh in place very quickly and now as i look at you know 54 percent this quarter kelly your guidance suggests 30 percent 31 percent q3 and 15 percent q4 so all, all that is just a lead up for eric what is your top one or two priorities in the next 12 months as you go from this hyper growth to a much more reasonable growth period if, if you could just sort of contrast those for us i think that would be really helpful sure sure so i would say patrick that's a great question first of all you look at it you know prior to you know pandemic you know look at our growth always you know focus on the enterprise cost right the first uh, you know service video conferencing we introduced the second revenue stream zoom phone both of them are doing well and how to introduce the third one a fourth one how to you know double down on that this is always our top part right i you know if we, we did not realize this is a pandemic crisis otherwise several years ago probably we should have planned third or fourth services beforehand now actually now this is indeed indeed our strategy right you know how to introduce more and more you know revenue stream new services to support our enterprise customer. That's always top priority for us. Essentially, this is part of our overall platform strategy, right? I mean, aside of that, also there's a, there's a new opportunity ahead of us. You know, as I mentioned earlier, right? We, you know, we never realized there's so many consumers, right? And, uh, you know, who are so loyal to our, you know, the platform, right? The usage is still pretty healthy. You know, how to embrace the consumer strategy it's also something on top of our minds as well, right? We never thought about that before. It's right high. Right? So those two things, enterprise platform and also consumer, those two things will drive our future growth. That's great. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Our next question is from Shevli Serafi with FBN Securities. Yes, uh, thank you very much. So I uh, look at your implied guide for Q4. It seems like you're, you're guiding it to Decel to uh, around 12% or so, uh, plus or minus from 30% or so in Q4, Q3, with a similar compare, I would argue. And it, it seems like it'll, it'll actually be down potentially sequentially from Q3. So, um, can you elaborate on why that might be the case? You talked about the online issues. How long do they last, for example? And if we go to like 10 to 12% growth in Q4, um, should we accelerate? afterwards after we the compares get easier how should we think about next year yeah so um in terms of what you're seeing in turn in q4 it is continued uncertainty around headwinds in the online segment absolutely that is driving that and for net in terms of how what that implies for next year we're not ready to give fy23 guidance today unfortunately so we'll you'll be prepared to do that when we get on the Q4 earnings call. And of course, we'll have a lot more learnings at that point to, to share with you, but that's, that is what is exactly what continues to drive that in Q4. Okay, is there any reason why the online issues would be bigger in EMEA than in the Americas in Asia? Well, that, <laughs> that's like the, the pandemic question, right? Because it really, what we've seen is this varies depending by region and by segment depending on where each of those countries or markets is in their pandemic life cycle and 
we've seen it ebb and flow over the last 18 months by market and so it's we we you know, it's, it, that's the challenge even i think that all businesses are having right now and thinking about the future with uncertainty so much uncertainty around the pandemic right now um it's just difficult to forecast exactly yeah to add on to what kelly said look at you know the, the the you know our user base in email you know seasonality also is a factor right in particular in the summertime in order to mention the, the COVID situation and the user there might have a little bit longer vacation, right? It's a seasonality for sure is a key factor. And that's another big difference compared to our user base here. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Our next question is from Ryan Coots with Needham. Hi, thanks for the question. Um, great to hear the progress in the enterprise uh, clicking along there and sounds like some real strength in APAC. What if you'd share with us any additional color on particular market verticals or applications you're seeing that are kind of key to penetrating and getting these big, you know, large global 2000 type wins. Thank you. Yes, Ryan, I would say, you know, first of all, the top two market is, you know, uh, education and healthcare is still pretty strong and also will bring us more opportunities when we expand into the international market like APAC. And also like those telco, you know, telecom sale, right? Those kind of a telco partnership will further help us for us to penetrate into each of those APEC countries, right? In terms of new opportunities, you know, recently we launched, you know, Zoom apps and also, you know, like, uh, you know, some of the partners, they build a new solution upon our platform, like a class technologies, right? I think a lot of new opportunities, right? We do not need to build by ourselves, right? And, we, you know, those third party customers, they can leverage our, you know, uh, either API or SDK or Zoom app to build all kinds of, uh, uh, you know, the new, uh, uh, solutions, you know, to, you know, focus on all those vertical markets or even the department as well, right? That's uh, where the opportunities, you know, uh, are coming from. So you're seeing some opportunities to upsell into the CPaaS type applications in the enterprise? Yeah, uh, both actually. Yeah, because, you know, if those third party partners, they build a very healthy business, also bringing the Zoom, you know, to the installer base and also the, the uh, by establishing the trust, right? You also can upsell in more stuff, right? Essentially, it's a very healthy channel not only for their own business doing very well, but also as a great channel for us. Helpful, thanks, sir. Thank you, Ryan. Our next question is from CD Panagrahi with Mizuho. Hey guys, uh, thanks for taking my question. Uh, I just wanted to dig into the enterprise segment. Uh, Q1, Q2, the, those are two big renewal quarters now that's behind now. So what sort of changes you are doing on your go-to-market strategy, mainly increasing quota carrying sales rate or any changes that do you, you are doing for this normalized environment? And phone used to be one of the big cross-sell you know, uh, opportunity for you. And how should you think about the phone as you get into more normalized renewal environment? So we are absolutely continuing to invest in our sales capacity we are focused on certain regions, especially where we see lots of opportunity like Asia Pac. We recently hired a new leader there and are really excited about the progress we're, we're already seeing with his leadership. And then we are continuing to invest in marketing. So, you know, as we've moved post pandemic era a little bit in terms of, of not post pandemic, but sort of some of what we saw um, from last year with the lift in brand awareness, we're continuing now to think about how do we invest more in specific product marketing around Zoom phone, around Zoom rooms, as well as digital marketing campaigns. So helping to community drive additional leads for all of our teams on a global basis. And then also the channel has, continues to be a really important um, aspect of our go-to-market. So the channel uh, was responsible for approximately 27% of our Zoom phone sales in Q2. We added six additional master agent partners during Q2. So really excited about continuing to invest in the channel on a global basis. Thanks, Kelly. Right, our next question is from Alex Zukin with Wolf Research. Hey guys, thanks for taking the question. So I think I'm gonna, I'll probably touch on a, a, a topic that's been mentioned here before, because I think a lot of people that are investing in the company at this point, they really are investing in the 
non-online story of the company, right? The enterprise story, the large business. There's a lot of metrics. There, there's a lot of kind of pollution and noise in these metrics. How do we think about the growth of the important part of the business for investors, meaning the over 10 employee uh, customer base, either from an incremental bookings perspective, from an incremental revenue perspective, and when does the headwind or anchor on the business from uh, you know the pandemic, from the you know the the once in a generation SMB uh, buying pattern. When does that trough? Uh, and so when do we see a normalized kind of normalized growth rate for the company? Yeah. So thank you, Alex. First of all, we we agree with you that you really um, we want everyone focused on the long term potential of the up market. Um, as a reminder, in Q2, that segment of the business grew at twice the rate of the online business. So that gives you some indication of how those two segments are, are diverging a little bit. And then um, as we look forwards, it's, I guess the best way to help you think about it is you, you want to look at like the net dollar, the implied net dollar expansion rate that we were talking about earlier, right? You can think about What's happening there is the, the net dollar expansion rate for the online segment is under one, right? That gives you some idea of, of what's happening again, how to think about those two different segments of our business. In terms of, you know, where is, is there a trough? I think that um, it's back to kind of trying to predict a pandemic, which is, is a difficult thing for obviously anybody in the world to do right now. Um, and as much as we're excited about you know, vaccines being more widely distributed, unfortunately, as we see Delta continuing to grow in certain parts of the world, we have even in the last few weeks, like seen, seen certain pockets of, of strength. So I think that that's gonna depend on really what we continue to see in terms of um, the spread of the variants around the world. Got it. And I guess maybe for Eric, the, the, you mentioned the seasonality, the vacations in Europe. Is there a way to kind of get a, a, a sense for the Delta part of the pun about just EMEA SMB uh, versus US SMB, just so we can get some sense of that that magnitude change? I think overall, I think our upper market are doing well, you know, especially, you know, look at the North America business, right? You know, in the EMEA, I think the mass market, online SMB, I think not, you know, I think it did not do well, you know, in the last quarter, you know, seasonality, COVID situation for sure, you know, Made things uh, a little bit worse because the longer vacation or so on and so forth. Here, look at our North America market. I think the upsell phone and also the Zoom rooms because uh, every company I think they started going back to office. The new opportunities, you know, are, are you know are, are coming. Are also doing very well. That's why I say even if a little bit of China on SMB, but by and large, we did not see the big drop. And because offset by the the the, open, the hybrid work uh, opportunities, right? I think look at APAC, APAC, we did not see that at all, right? You know, in the last quarter, it's still doing very well. You know, uh, the, I think overall, we, as you mentioned earlier, we got to go back, you know, to our enterprise play, right? Because the last year, you know, I think uh, the online business used to be just a, a, a marketing channel, right? But however, not only a marketing channel, but also contribute a lot to our revenue from a percentage you know, perspective. Now, uh, given that that percentage is going to go down for online, you know, in the long run, it's very healthy for our ratings, right? With that, we can focus on our core enterprise customer. And plus, you know, given that we become a householder name, it will bring a new opportunity to monetize. It used to be the monetization for online low end users, just the online subscription. I would say that may not be the sustainable strategy, right? To for the uh, online users monetization. You got to have other ways, right? To monetize those uh, online you know, the, the installer base. That's why we are very excited about the future. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Alex. Our next question is from James Fish with Piper Sandler. Hey, guys. Thanks for the question. Um, on the win with Seagate as an example here, how often are you seeing it that phone is leading to a greater number of seats at existing customers? Or really, how can we think about that potential uplift within just your install base today of selling phone with meetings that creates a greater number of seats at current accounts, not just meeting seats, but overall employees that you can actually sell phone into? You know, is it a two times opportunity that we just don't have as many meeting seats because you can have more, uh, you can have less hosts than you do employees? Uh, James, that's a great observation. 
I think uh, you are so right. I think in the one year ago, we really did not see that, right? Normally they, they buy more meeting licenses and then, you know, probably a little bit of upsell for phone and also for the existing uh, installer base, we upsell phone. You know, for the brand new customers, you know, because the, you know, the customer look at one platform for both video and voice, right? They understand video and voice are converging into one platform. Plus, you know, our phone business is very mature now, right? Every quarter doing very well, customer like it is ready. It's not like, oh, this is something brand new. They do not want to take any risk. It's very mature. Plus the integrated experience, both video and voice are doing very well. Essentially, you know, from now on, I would say probably, I do not know, but I guess probably more and more customers, they are not going to view, uh, I need to deploy a video for us and then deploy a phone. You know, very likely on day one, they will deploy both. Given the dynamics of each business, you know, sometimes probably they want to deploy more functions than the meeting license. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, James. Next question is from Will Power with Baird. Great, thanks for taking the question. I guess, um, you know, tech question probably for you, Kelly, as we think about that, you know, the 10 plus employee cohort, you know, kind of your up market segment, how do we think about one customer growth from here? Um, and two, as we think about that net expansion, you know, you've been you know above 130 percent. What's the sustainability of that, right? Because you've got a, a number of growth drivers, yet you've got the law of large numbers kind of working against you. How do we think about the outlook on that front? Yeah, um, in terms of net dollar expansion, we expected to stay above 30, um, certainly for Q3, and then um, in terms of Q4, we expected to be in at least in that range, not, um, you know, it's a, it's a quarter out. We don't know exactly, but we're predicting it to be right in that same range still for, for Q4. And then in terms of the customer growth, I think that what you're going to continue to see is ongoing growth driven by large deals. So the customer count may, may slow, but that you're going to continue to see growth driven by these big deals as we see opportunities to continue to cross-sell with Zoom phone. Um, as, you, as you heard, right, we beat our two largest deals record in the same day this quarter. So really seeing opportunities there. And then as people are planning to go back to the office, also opportunities for Zoom rooms. And then think about Zoom events. So you're going to start to see opportunities for larger and larger, bigger customer wins. And um, I think the other thing to note, you know, we talked we talk about the quarter, but just want to make sure everybody understands, like, you know, we had a deal this quarter that now became our lar our new largest, sorry, our new largest customer. So not our new customer, an existing customer, but now with their upsell, right, they became the largest customer. So we're continuing to see these really significant large wins, and that I expect to continue. Great, right, thank you. Our next question is from Matthew Neekum with Deutsche Bank. Hey, thanks for taking the question. Um, you talked a little bit about some more measured behavior from customers in terms of buying patterns. I'm just wondering, can you talk a little bit about the competitive backdrop, whether you've seen peers maybe getting more aggressive, especially as larger enterprise customers really take their time to reevaluate the future of work post COVID? Thanks. Eric, you want to talk about competitive? Sure, sure. I think, Matt, you look at the trend, right? The, the, the future work, hybrid work, for sure, that would be the mainstream, right? And however, and because of uh, the uh, because of embracing hybrid work, a lot of employees, right, you know, still need to work from home or maybe uh, work in, in the remote locations. And not like, uh, you know, and prior to pandemic crisis, right? Quite often, you know, and you might deploy a solution you know, this is good enough, right? And give employees now to support a hybrid work, the best breed of service will do very well, right? Otherwise, because, you know, you look at employees, they do not have IT support, you know, sitting next to them, right? And plus you really worry about the productivity if you do not give the best tools. That's why, you know, good enough solution will not do well. You know, every business is, they would like to deploy the best breed of service always you know give the employees a much better tools right to improve their productivity to help employees because to support a hybrid work is not that straightforward right and i'll give an example like a conference solution you know we introduced a smart gallery feature otherwise you know customers they do not dare to have a meeting right someone are sitting in the conference room some are, will join remotely 
that experience is not as good as today, the, the, the webinar or meeting, right? That's why I think uh, to the hybrid work certainly will help us Zoom, right? Even some of sometimes our competitors, you know, might elevate the price. I think, you know, the good news is the customer they really want to have very reliable frictionless you know, platform, you know, very easy to use. You know, I think that's the reason why, you know, I think the Zoom is positioned much better than any of our competitors. Thanks, Eric. Thank you, Mike. Our next question is from Bo Young Kim with City. Hi, I'm Officer Tyler Radke. Um, earlier in the Q&A, you shared some progress around um, the major master agent program and also had cited some really large international phone deals. So uh, I wanted to hear about what you're seeing in terms of the productivity of the channel partners and international markets relative to what you're seeing um, from channel partners in the US and to what extent is that impacted by the nascent stage of the master agent program and in international markets, as well as the nascent state of the broader market in cloud-based phones. Thanks. So I think we're seeing strength in our channel partners globally. So, but as you say, it's a much newer program and a much smaller internationally. So excited to really, this is a one of the main focuses for our channel team, which is expanding outside of the US. It's focused for the rest of the year. In terms of productivity, I don't think that it really varies. I mean, we were really excited about the telecom cell deal, which is one of our, our largest channel partner deals, ISV deals uh, to date. So that's really exciting, but we've had significant wins in the US as well. So not seeing dramatic differences in productivity on a global basis at this point. Great. Our next question is going to be from Matt Stotler with William Blair. Yeah, hey guys. Hey, thank you for taking the question. Um, you know, I think uh, just just one from me. Uh, obviously, as um, you guys have spoken to so far, the the enterprise opportunity here is is really kind of the you know what's what's really uh, you know exciting and compelling going forward. But given the commentary around um, you know finding other ways to monetize the base, you know whether that's consumer or otherwise, uh, would love to maybe get uh, an update or, or whatever color you can provide on. Uh, the level of freemium usage that you're seeing today, right? And outside of the seasonality with uh, with education, um, just you know the level of freemium usage on the platform, how that's changed over the past four or five quarters. Um, thoughts on the back half there, and then um, you know any commentary on what conversion you you've seen there, or you expect that you could uh, see if you decided to really try and monetize that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah go ahead, Ted. You go ahead. Uh, so we still see free users, um, you know, it's a, a large, they've really grown over the last 18 months and they're about 30% of our minutes usage today as compared to like 10% pre pandemic. So that gives you an idea of the number of free, you know, we, we don't talk about the number of users, but that at least gives you a relative understanding of how they've grown over time. And um, like we always say, as Eric mentioned about our care value of care, you know, our core value of care, we really care about all those free users, especially to keep people connected during these more difficult times. And there's always, you know, a hope that, that they continue to convert or that they have the opportunity to continue to expose more new users to the power of Zoom. Got it. Thank you. Our next question is from Heim Siegel with LSR Advisors. Hi, Kelly and Eric. How are you? Hey, um, nice to see you. Uh, I had a couple of questions if, if you have time, but uh, since obviously the focus is on enterprise, I just wanted to know how fast the, the sales force is growing and when um, efficiency for that sales force starts to kick in. Um, I guess that's one. And also just related to that on operating expenses. So I'm not sure how long you expect uh, flatter sequential growth, but on the op operating expense, it seems like maybe it'll start to grow faster than uh, revenues. And I'm just wondering, you know, with relation to focusing on getting the enterprise business going, you know, how fast expenses will grow versus revenues. Yeah. So as we've, we've been saying for the last several quarters, there are areas that we 
were not able to hire and invest in as quickly as revenue grew last year. And so what we've been doing on the last couple of quarters is focusing on reaccelerating the investment, especially in the areas of R&D, as well as quota carrying heads. And we are absolutely continuing to do that. We um, still are underinvested in R&D at a little over 5% of revenue. And you know the, the long-term target is eight to 10%. So we're continuing to hire as quickly as we can. And then similarly, in terms of quota carrying heads, we're being very thoughtful about the segments and the regions in which we're hiring. But there, remember, like stepping back for a minute, there is a huge TAM and a huge opportunity out there. And we want to continue to add quota carrying heads and sales capacity into our system to take advantage of that. So as long as we continue to see opportunity for growth, we will continue investing in quota carrying heads. We are also um, as I mentioned earlier, accelerating our spend in marketing as we were we were able to pull back a little bit on that last year, but we think now is the right time to continue reinvesting there. And then, you know, the, the two areas that we always look to be um, as efficient as we can are our GNA and COGS. And, you know, GNA is kind of right in the range of where we would want it to be for the long term. Over time, we do expect COGS um, to decrease as we continue to move more and more of our services out of the public cloud into the data center, our own data centers. I mean, we're always going to have a hybrid approach there, but also eventually at some point, right, when K through 12 schools are more free to go back to campuses, we do expect to see improvement in our gross margins, but we will absolutely continue to, to support those students in schools as long as, as we think it's needed. Is there a general timing of efficiency where you expect, you know, that to kick in for the enterprise, for the salespeople in the enterprise? I know you've been growing it and I know it takes yeah. time. I'm just wondering if there's like a timing where a big tranche is going to start, you know, really performing for you. No, I mean, well, I should, this is what I would say is we are continuing to hire quota carrying heads quickly and we'll continue to do so. So that means there's a constant state of having ramping reps in the system. And yeah. since we have no plans to stop hiring quota carrying heads in the near future, that I can't say when all of a sudden they're going to necessarily be more efficient. Thank you very much. Our next question is from Rishi Jaluria with RBC. All right. Hey, hey, Eric, Kelly, Tom, thanks so much hey. for taking my questions. Good, good to see you all. Um, I wanted to just ask about Zoom events. Um, so, it, it, you know, I know initially when you've talked about the, the product, it was kind of pitched as a little bit of a monetization vector uh, for the prosumer segment, right? Helping, you know, fitness instructors, yoga instructors run class online. But clearly, it seems like there's much grander ambitions, right? The fact that you're going to run Zoomtopia on that, I think, tells us there's maybe a bigger enterprise opportunity. Uh, you know, and, and, and even as uh, companies are looking at doing in-person conferences, again, they, they want to have a strong virtual and hybrid component to it. So can you maybe talk a little bit about what you see as a longer term vision with Zoom event, especially the enterprise? And, 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 and maybe let's go on that. Thanks. Yeah, Rishi, that's a great question. So remember last uh, year, last October, right, at Zoomtopia, we introduced the Zoom events. You know, we started from on Zoom at that time. And, you know, we thought about how to have those, uh, you know, and the people, you know, working from home still can get a training, right? Like a fitness, you know, uh, online you know, classes, join all those classes. That's, you know, the reason why we, we, we started building the Zoom events. However, you know, again, you know, we have, uh, we always listen to our customers, in particular, our enterprise customers, right? And they all, you know, told us, hey, there's even a, a more, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, opportunities around the, the corporate events. You know, the corporate public is like a Zoomtopia. They all told us, hey, we badly needed that. We badly needed that. We already have a webinar platform. They want us, you know, to extend that, right? You know, how to expand it into an even bigger, you know, the, the you know, annual user conference like Zoomtopia. That's why we sort of pivoted our strategy, right? And doubled down our corporate, you know, the word of the, on Zoom, which is uh, rebranded as Zoom events, right? We do see, you know, a, a huge opportunity. I'm inside of that, you know, the consumer world, you know, is not a called a Zoom events anymore. This is more like a on Zoom website. We still were well, going to aggregate, aggregate all those uh, consumer driven events, right? You know, like, uh, you know, online fitness class and so on and so forth. But for now, you know, if you look at the short term opportunities, Zoom events will do well because many of our existing customers told us, 
we need a platform like that because the trust already built, right? They do not want to go to any other platform. They are very patient to wait. That's the reason why we shifted our strategy a little bit since last uh, uh, Zoom topia. All right, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. All right, well, thank you to all of our analysts. That's all the time for questions that we have for today. And That's all, awesome. Tom. Yeah, bring you back thank, on the con. Great. Thank you, everybody. And um, we hope to speak to you more this rest of the quarter and uh, see you at Zoomtopia. Anything else, Eric? Yeah, thank you all for your time today. Hope you all will join next uh, month's Zoomtopia, September 13th and 14th. I really appreciate it for your great support, as always. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.